Hi, everybody. Welcome to Small Steps, Big Life. My name is Nathan Aswell, and I'm based near Vancouver, Canada. And it is my great pleasure today to speak to someone who, by golly, is living a great big life. And she's going to tell us the small steps that she has taken to get there. Penny Nichols, fellow singer-songwriter, now based in Morro Bay, California. So, Penny, let's start right there. Where the heck is Morro Bay? It uh, sounds like a beautiful tucked-away spot. It is. And it's great to see you. It's great Online. to see you. And everyone else who sees this, yes. howdy. Howdy. Welcome. Howdy. Welcome, everybody. Some, summer songs, folks, past, present, and future. And fans of Penny. Morro Bay is in Central California, halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Okay. And it's an absolutely beautiful place to live. There is a rock in the middle of the bay, a huge rock. Mm -hmm. And that's a Morro. It's called a Morro because it is the core of a volcano. And over oh. millions of years, the actual volcano and all of its earth and trees have been eroded away by wind and water and left only the core of lava wow. from, from this, you know, the heart of the volcano as this big rock in the mm. middle of the bay. It's, it's very cool. Wow. Yeah. And how did, how did you find out about this place? Well, my uh, family, my husband's family lives in San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. and we would come out for holidays to spend with the family and, you know, drive around and discover the area. And uh, when we left New York in uh, 2012, we decided to move to Morro Bay because it's so beautiful. Wow. Excellent. Uh, as you were talking about that, some of your friends have joined you, Sharon and Andy. Howdy, Sharon and Andy. And they, uh, well, I know I, I met Sharon online a few days ago. Are they both people that you know through Summer Songs? Yes. Yes, they are. And Sharon is one of the great treasures of Summer Songs. Mm -hmm. She's uh, right now, she's our marketing director and she helps with a lot of different things. And she's just extremely talented. Mm -hmm. She's working on a fabulous new album of songs that she's doing mm -hmm. um, that's coming out sometime soon called Cole Isha. Uh -huh. It's the, a woman's voice. It's all about, uh, um, it's based on uh, women from the Old Testament. Wow. And yeah. really fantastic. And yeah. she's, I'm just, I was just laughing because she wrote, ah, oh, she's enjoying receiving your praise. Well, she deserves it. Yeah, I guess she does. But, you know, Sharon is a great example of what happens to people when they come. Mm hmm summer songs so before we get to summer songs let's set this up a little bit so you know you know the gift what i what i enjoy so much is and, and it's happening with you as well i was reading a little bit of your biography this afternoon before our conversation and i thought gee i'm glad i didn't know all these things about you so that i wouldn't be intimidated i just thought you was penny this lovely warm person who sings and writes songs and and I look at this who's who of people you perform with, and I'm like, holy cow, I'm glad I didn't know that. Um, hi, Miss Nichols. Um, so pleased to know you. Glad I didn't have to go through any of that stuff, you know. Can you see my garage behind me? Yes, I can. Very gorgeous. <laughs> it's me. Keeps you, it's keeps you grounded. Yeah, keeps, keeps you grounded. grounded. You know. So. <laughs> So, so you've been you've been uh, you know on the scene for many many years, folk singing and then all kinds of stuff. The, the big comment that I think most people, as a starting point, besides your career singing in the coffee houses and stuff, was being a part of uh, Jimmy Buffett's experience. Yeah, I was one of the original coral referettes with my dear friend Deborah McCall. Mm -hmm. Yep, we were it. And then, and then it was after that that you started writing your own songs, yes? Or were no, you writing actually, before? I started writing songs. Um, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles in the mm -hmm. 50s and early 60s and started writing songs in 1965. Mm -hmm. And um, my, all my friends at the time, we were all part of a folk club mm -hmm. in Orange County called the Folk Swingers. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and the Folk Swingers, uh, we met at a place called the Paradox. And mm -hmm. so it was me and 
uh, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band guys who had just formed at McCabe's in Long Beach uh, with Jackson Brown as one of the members, as, mm -hmm. well, as well as a bunch of other cool guys. And I was uh, John McEwen's girlfriend at uh -huh. the, when I was in high school. And uh, at a certain point along there, uh, Jackson left the dirt band and John McEwen joined it and his oh. older brother started managing them. And Jack's, Jack moved to back up to LA. I think he had gone to Sunny Hills High School and I had gone to Garden Grove. No, actually to Santiago, which is in Garden Grove. And uh, so we ended up being managed by the same managers in Hollywood, uh, in Laurel Canyon, Billy and Judy James. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, you know, opening shows at the Troubadour for Mort Saul and a whole bunch of people. And uh, also at the Ashgrove, Ed Pearl um, had me open shows for a lot of people there. And I played all over Orange County and the Golden Bear and mm -hmm. Socrates Prison. And, um, and of course, at uh, the Paradox and um, well, just a bunch of clubs. There was a whole scene, a whole little music scene. And what came out of that was a lot of really interesting singer-songwriters, mm -hmm. which hadn't really been a part of the folk scene very much up to that point, but Jack Tension, Tim Buckley, Jackson Brown, Steve Noonan, uh, myself not so much, but these other people uh, and you know, became much more successful than I did, but I wasn't ready to be. And I wasn't the kind of success that I was ready for, but mm -hmm. that's where I came from. That's when I started writing songs. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, it's been a very, very powerful motivating force in my life and uh, healing as well. Very mm -hmm. therapeutic, very healing. But it took me a long time of growing up to start writing really great songs. Mm -hmm. And and tell us more about that. What? Yeah, I'm just curious to hear more about that process. Like, well, I think you know, if you if a person were interested, one could go back to listen to my first album, which I made in 1967 for Buddha Records, called mm -hmm. Penny's Arcade. Mm -hmm. That album kind of was something that I stumbled into in mm -hmm. a very very youthful, very naive fashion. Mm -hmm. And I was at the time in 1967 in the spring. I was living in San Francisco and playing at the all the clubs in in North Beach and in in the city, um, like um, the Matrix and the FW Coo Memorial Auditorium at the Old Spaghetti Factory and the Fillmore and the Avalon and places like that and build. Graham, who was a friend of my manager, Billy James, kind of took me under his wing and let me open a bunch of shows at the Fillmore and stuff like that. And um, I, for a while, I was, during that time, I was dating Steve Miller, who I had been opening for The Matrix. Yeah. And um, he had not treated me the way that I wanted to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one day when Artie Rip from Buddha Records came over to his house to try to sell him on a record deal, um, <laughs> Steve turned him down flat and kind of dissed him in front of me. So then Artie Rip turned to me and said, well, can I offer you a record deal? <laughs> and of course, just to piss off Steve, I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> And that got me in a lot of trouble. But wow. the, the upshot of it was that I made this record uh, for uh, Buddha Records called Penny's Arcade, and it sold over 50,000 copies. Hmm. And that's, that's, that's a great record of where a young beginning songwriter would uh, start, which was these very, very idealistic, very um, flower power very hippie songs, you know, yeah. what's the color of love, the mountain song and look around rock, which is a raga, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, summer rain, which is a beautiful song. But my mother had been a singer in a big band. And when we were growing up, we had 
I had five brothers and we had our own little barber shop quintet. And so I was very, very attuned to background singing and a big fan of, um, uh, uh, what's what their names? The guy who first did multi-tracking with, uh, uh, Les Paul, Les Paul and Mary Ford mm -hmm. and they're the multi-tracking harmony parts mm -hmm. that they did. And so my first record is full of harmony and it's full of these choral arrangements. And that was something I was very interested in at the time. So you, if you, if a person were very interested, you could find that album or find those songs and listen to them and see, this is where someone like me, a naive young hippie girl would start with mm -hmm. songwriting. But all the other people I was involved with were um, much more sophisticated in their songwriting than I was. I wasn't really ready to be a prime time player in those days back in the 60s, but I did learn a lot. And uh, the, the time that I spent with my friends listening to them influenced me greatly as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, and so of course that's been an ongoing exploration all those, yeah. started all those years ago and continues. Yeah. So somewhere along the line, you had a desire to, I, I, I don't want to say what, what's on the page. I loved reading it, but I'd rather hear you say it in your own words. At some point, you were part of a, a camp experience with some other people and it, it gave you an idea. Oh, yeah. You mean, um, I like going forward now. Okay. Yeah. Skipping over the 70s. Oh, well, don't skip over them. I mean, by all means, tell us about the 70s. It's all good. I mean, we, we could be here for hours. But it, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of touring with various bands. I With Buddha Records, I went to Europe and toured in Europe with me and Captain Beefheart and some other people. And we met the Beatles in London and we did a bunch of stuff. And it was extremely wild and strange. Um. So I'm writing all about that stuff in my autobiography. Oh, wonderful. But then I came back, I got out of my Buddha Records contract and tried to get another deal and spent uh, a number of years retiring from the music business when my brother died. Uh, and then getting back into the music business as a uh, background singer and vocal arranger. And that was in the mid seventies and I started uh, and it was during that time that I belonged to a fairly famous jazz choir in LA that Bill Elliott and Jennifer Warrens and uh, Greg Presepino and Peter McCann and I started. And then uh, Bill took it over and kind of ran with that jazz choir. But through the choir, I made a lot of connections. And that's how I ended up meeting Deborah McCall and becoming a member of uh, the Coral Reefer band in the 70s. And it was through that work that I got a platinum album uh, for doing uh, Son of a Son of a Sailor. And uh, by the end of the 70s, I was so burnt out on being on the road, uh, being strung out on drugs and alcohol. Mm. Uh, you know, I ended up one tour with walking pneumonia, strung out on cocaine, um, just sitting home alone, drinking a bottle of wine every night, you know, and thinking, mm. this is not the way I want to live. This one, I'm not going to survive this. <laughs> and two, I'm not happy. And this doesn't really fulfill my needs, being a background singer and being in bands like that and having that kind of a pop, oh, what would be now thought of as kind of like an American Idol type life. It just is, I didn't know anyone in it who was really happy. Mm -hmm. And the higher up the ladder you go, the, the more unhappy people seem to be. And so uh, at the end of the 70s, I decided to uh, take a break from the music business and go back to school and get my degrees because what I found really turned me on and really got me excited. One thing, I started meditating and I became a Buddhist and that changed the way my mind works. I stopped uh, smoking grass and I stopped drinking and I went into uh, psychoanalysis 
and I worked out a lot of problems that I was having and started to understand myself better. And in that process, I figured out that what would really be exciting for me would be to figure out or to go do some research on how people learn to sing on pitch and how people learn to remember harmony parts. Because I'm half deaf. I was born with only one ear. Wow. And I, I wanted to know why do I have perfect relative pitch? Why have the, I've got this photographic memory for harmony and yeah. for vocal arrangements. Why is that? And why, why is it that people can, that can hear really well may not necessarily have that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go do research about that. And I ended up going to um, Harvard uh, and studying uh, at MIT with a woman named uh, uh, Jean Bamberger and also another teacher, uh, Eleanor Duckworth, at Harvard in the graduate school there after getting a double degree in music and psychology from Antioch University. And this is now we're getting into the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And that's during the time that I also at the same time I was really on fire to do these things, but I was also still getting a lot of work in the music business uh, doing studio work. So I would mm -hmm. get up, I got a real job, <laughs> first in my life, um, um, at, in a design firm. And I'd get up in the morning, I'd go to the design firm, I'd work there till um, around five o'clock. And then I would go to school out at Antioch in Marina Del Rey, for two or three hours every evening. Mm -hmm. And then after school, I would have these uh, sessions set up and I'd get them to set them up starting at 10 p.m. And I would show up at 10 and we would do background vocals and I'd be done by two and I'd go home and start it all over the next day. Wow. So I was having an amazing time. And the most important part of that was that I was getting my needs met. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, it wasn't just so much the money, it was the meaning, having a meaningful life and doing work that got me to where I needed to go. The kind of, I think that there's a really strong, and some people, I know it is true for me, a really strong desire to live a life that serves people, mm -hmm. that serves humanity in some way. And I felt that this was a way for me to do that. And, you know, until I did some meditating and did my work and analysis and stuff, I wasn't able to articulate all this. I just knew that being, you know, a background singer uh, and being in rock and roll bands and stuff was just not satisfying. It wasn't a good life for me. So I made this huge transition away from that. And that's when I was nominated for some Grammys. You know, the irony, of course, you know, is that I didn't care anymore, but... <laughs> I, of course, I do care because it's a great honor. But at the same time, I, I felt like, okay, I understand what that was. I understand that life. But now I'm going to move on. Mm -hmm. So that's how um, I became a teacher. Also, I had a wonderful uh, singing teacher, Florence Riggs, mm -hmm. who I still work with. And she comes and teaches at camp sometimes. And she taught me an awful lot. And it was through working with her that I really got interested in how people remember what they hear and how people sing. Have I blabbed enough? Do you want to speak? No, this is wonderful. I mean, the whole, <clears throat> the whole point of the, 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 what I'm most excited about, about this whole format is wanting to share people's journey and how one small step lead, leads to another, leads to another. So you're just beautifully articulating all that. It's great. Well, you know, it's a funny thing about a life, you know, you, you look, you, as time goes by, there's more of it to look back on mm -hmm. and to go, oh, look at this. Look at how this worked out. Look at this panorama and how this is playing out, you know, yeah. over time. And you begin to see, well, you know, if you're not where you were hoping that you would be by, the, you know, then then it's time to look deeper and mm -hmm. see, you know, where are you and what are, what are you not doing or doing that you'd like to change? Or how would you like to make, you know, because you are the author. You are the creator of the life that you're having. Yep. And you can change it, you know. Yep. 
And this is an important uh, thing for people to, I think, to understand is that, is that we are all, we all have the creative genius, a genius inside of us. A genius is not something we are. It's something that passes through us right. and comes out. And each person being able to find what, what their quote unquote genius is, is one of my, one of the things I love about summer songs is that it, you know, allows people to explore and to find what it is that, 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 they, that they're passionate about mm -hmm. love and stuff, you know. So let's talk about summer songs. Oh, okay. Now we can talk about summer songs. Sounds like, yeah. All right. Sounds like now's the time. So let's jump. <laughs> so, um, so I worked on my dissertation through the 80s and graduated from Harvard with a doctorate in education in 1991. And in the meantime, I'd gone to Puget Sound Guitar Workshop to mm -hmm. teach singing mm -hmm. uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s for three mm -hmm. years. And I had never been anywhere where adults were going to camp. And I didn't get to go to camp when I was little. So I had never had that experience. And I was so totally inspired. Mm -hmm because it was the most liberating and inspiring thing to be with a group of people who were all making music and learning stuff. It was like giving my child self the opportunity mm -hmm. to play and have fun, you know. And <laughs> from the, the first camp I went to, and I was there as a teacher, right? But I mm -hmm. went home and wrote 30 songs in a month after the first Puget oh. Sound guitar workshop I went to. And uh, I realized, well, this is one of the most powerful creative experiences I've ever had in my life. You know, and I thought this is fantastic. And uh, after a few years in the 90s, my husband and I moved back to Woodstock, New York to be near uh, the Buddhist monastery where we'd met. Huh. And I started working for Jay Unger and Molly Mason um, and was, you know, administering their books and their publishing companies and everything. And they put on these camps called fiddle and dance camps. Hmm. And I went down to their fiddle and dance camp once. This was during the 90s. And I thought to myself, wow, what if I put on a, a songwriting camp? And so one of my jobs at the time was to... Um, be a coordinator for the business program at the local community college. And so I proposed to them that I put on a class that met at Ashokan through the SUNY uh, system uh, on songwriting mm -hmm. and brought in some songwriting teachers to do it. And that was the first summer songs. That was in 1999. We had 27 people there, including David Roth and Sloan Wainwright, who still teach for me, and mm -hmm. Steve Gillette and Bob Frankie. And there were only 27 of us there. And we stayed up till four o'clock in the morning every night for an entire weekend and just cried. I mean, we just sobbed. We laughed so hard. You know, our stomachs hurt, your face hurt from laughing and smiling. And at the end of camp, we just got in a big circle and cried together and sang songs and said, we have to do this every year for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. This is the most healing thing, <laughs> you know, because most songwriters are very, feel very isolated mm -hmm. and they don't have a community uh, or anyone to listen. And so listening and learning how to listen well and be supportive without being, um, you know, super critical and judgmental is a very important part of what makes summer songs so great is everybody listening to one another. So we've been doing it since 1999. Amazing. And at some point <clears throat> you had a desire, well, did you, is it when you moved to back to um, tomorrow that you decided to do summer songs West as well, or did that happen? Before I, well, you know, <laughs> Being from California, um, I wanted to spend as much time in my home state as I could. Uh, starting in 2004, I started a West Coast camp so that I could come out to the West Coast every year. 
right. and be with my LA uh, family and friends and be out here too. And so I fly across the country every year to attend camps on both coasts. Um, and so out here we have another group of wonderful teachers like Severn Brown, who's one of my dearest friends. He's Jackson Brown's brother and we're very close. Um, and uh, Ed Tree and um, Rebecca Troon, the, there's a group called the Honeysuckle Possums, Rebecca Troon and uh, Susan Reeves and Nicola Gordon, who are just wonderful and we all love working together. So that's we've developed a whole different community. And actually mm -hmm. the, the music on the East Coast and the music on the West Coast are like two different flavors of ice cream. Wow. Yeah. Say, say more yeah. about that. I'd love yeah. to hear more about that. Feel the different cultural influences and the way that people are writing and what they're writing oh. about and how they construct a melody and how they put it together. Uh, that's oh. just fascinating to listen to. And so so give, give me some words around either one of those, Penny. Like what, what how would you describe it? I mean, it's hard. It's very individual. Yeah. Too. Well, there was a group uh, we had. We had a great group. Um, actually, I guess I, I would say from a more kind of an overview, I would say that there's a couple of influences on the East Coast that really come to the fore. One of them is the Roots music movement through New England, the contra dance, uh, and, you know, the kind of fiddle and dance traditional folk world. That right. comes into play. People on the East Coast, it seems to me, are much more likely to have gone to summer camp when they were kids, mm. people on the West Coast. And their their willingness to just jump in and be at camp and do camp things is remarkable. You know, we have costumes, we wear stuff, we run around crazy and, and you know, sing and dance and have fun and it's it's amazing the east coast people but the, you can really hear the influence of uh new england contra dance the um also the um cape breton uh canadian music the quebecois mm -hmm. there's also the influence of new york city and mm -hmm. all the singer songwriters there and they're writing very sophisticated Music. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a Broadway feel sometimes. People who come mm -hmm. to the New York camp, you never find that out on the West Coast. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And then, like, there's a, there was a group. Um, a, one of my friends, John Martucci, wrote this great song called "Keep On Truckin'." It was mm -hmm. like a classic uh, New England style singer songwriter song that they did. I'm going to keep on trucking, da -dee 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 -dee. keep on trucking, da -dee 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 -dee. just beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. but then out here on the West Coast, you have a totally different sound because there's much more of a Western feel. There's also a cowboy influence. There's mm -hmm. uh, the L.A. music scene, which also contains, there's quite a strong emphasis, even though you don't know it on the surface, the um, Mexican American culture and the Spanish culture that's been in California mm -hmm. for centuries pervades mm -hmm. the music here. The Latin influence oh. actually comes through. And there's also a Hawaiian influence in the way people play guitar and the kind mm -hmm. of chords they choose to use. People out here are much more likely to play um, major sevenths and, you know, things that have a much cooler feel and there also also i would say a west coast jazz like a mellow jazz influence out here that i don't hear as much on the east coast it's very interesting oh, yeah. oh, what yeah, cool. it. so what's that oh, what a thunk it what a thunk it yeah well and, and now you know from all the years that you've been doing it it's, yeah. it's wonderful so so when you first started in 99 you said there were 27 people yeah and what was the age range of everyone involved oh, that first year? Uh, well, was, it, you know, was it wide? It's adults um, because yeah. we don't have the staff or the supervision to deal with kids unless their parents bring them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they're supposed to be supervised by their parents. Um, right. 
So the age range is from 18 to 70 or even older. I think we have someone in the 80s coming to Summer Songs West. Uh, Michael mm -hmm. McNevin's dad is coming. Mm -hmm. And so has the, uh, has the age range widened as word has gotten out about the camp or has it been really wide? It's from been really wide from the get-go and Mm -hmm. uh, but the the what changes is that we get we're getting younger people. We get a lot of people um, in their uh, 30s and you know all through their 30s and 40s is when I think that when people are in their 20s they're they're not ready for camp on some level. Or we don't get a lot of 20 20 somethings. Uh, but by the time mm -hmm. people get into their 30s, they're starting to feel like, okay, I've got, I've got the basics down. Now I want to start feeding my soul. You know, mm -hmm. I want to start doing things that have meaning for me. And I'm thinking, in particular, mm -hmm. I'm thinking right now about my nephew, who I adore, uh, uh, Dustin. He, um, he's a lawyer, and I think mm -hmm. he's kind of typical of a. Uh, a pattern of how we get through life. You know, we start out first, you know, just trying to master skills and get to the point where we're adult enough to be able to take care of ourselves, to have a job, to get married, to whatever, you know. And it isn't until you kind of reach that point where you're just seeing over the edge, over the horizon line, a little on your ear. And that's when it happened for me, too. That's when I went back to school was just able to go, okay, what I created is not really what I want, but I can see the possibility of getting to where I want to go along about 30, in my early 30s, early to mid 30s. And that's when I, we start seeing people coming to camp because they're finally seeing, well, you know, this is where I, I need to dig a little deeper and, and listen to myself a little more carefully and understand myself better through music, mm -hmm. you know, and through songwriting and singing and guitar playing and piano, et cetera, you know. Yeah. And now I would imagine that most of the people that come to camp, um, well, let me back up and say it another way, that it's mostly word of mouth, that it's people who have come who just, you know, are taken over with the experience and then invite friends, family, and, you know, express like that in a very organic way as opposed to, well, you know, there is the internet and all that kind of stuff, but I'm sure it's mostly word of mouth from people who have experience who say, you've got to come and experience this with me. Well, you know, it is to a large extent, but there's also a kind of a wacky, ironic side of that, which is that, and we talk about it at disorientation at the end of camp, which is that. I love that. I love that you call it disorientation at the end. It's great. You know, we all <laughs> leave camp absolutely on cloud nine and think, oh, my God, this is going to change my life. This is the most fantastic thing I've ever done. And then you go home to your loved ones and yeah. your family and friends, and they've been, you know, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, mowing the lawn, while you've been out, you know, having fun. Yeah. And people have, a, uh, uh, um, you know, a tendency to just kind of, I can't believe what I did. Oh my God, it was so fantastic. You know, and just spout like a fire hose, all of the fun that they've had and the landscape of enthusiasm that they receive from that is like, uh-huh, could you take the trash out now? You know, yeah. people don't, they tend to don't get it. If It's one of those things where yeah. if you haven't experienced it, it's, it's hard to, to pass that along with your enthusiasm. So we always tell people when you get home, the first thing you're going to say is, how was your weekend, dear? Yeah. You know, and just let out a little bit of information and let people tell you how their life has been before you, you know, lay. Because it may be that it's people, only people who are there or songwriters who happen to have had this experience, who really can, you know, until you have the experience, it's hard to, to understand what the excitement's about. But, uh, but it does, yes, it does, it does grow through people um, telling each other about it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
And so what are the numbers, what, what, what did, have the numbers grown to in, in recent years? Well, you know, our, our best year was mm -hmm. we had 92 people oh. at Summer Songs East in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then, or maybe it was 2005. It was the year I was going through chemo, I think. And then we, so we thought, oh my God, this is too, so many people. We have to expand our, our staff and we have to get bigger and we have to be ready for, you know, large amounts of people. And then the depression hit the next year and our numbers went down to 54 people. And we had this huge staff. <laughs> Mm. And so we almost, you know, went out of business that year. But we learned how, thanks to David Roth, really, we learned how to cut back and to kind of trim back the sales to fit uh, our how many people were coming to camp. Because, you know, when we went through one heck of a depression there <coughs> with the, you know, the whole real estate thing and yeah. people had a hard time. And uh, so it was understandable, you know, not everybody could afford to uh, to come to camp. Yeah. Um, but, you know, things have gotten better. Uh, right now, we're about uh, 45 people into Summer Songs West and maybe probably 37, 38. We're getting up into 40 for Summer Songs East, which isn't happening till August. So I expect mm -hmm. we're going to have a big turnout for Summer Songs East in August. And is Summer Songs West the same size, a little bigger, a little smaller? Well, it was bigger for Winter Songs West this year. was a bigger camp. We had like 60-something, 60 67 people or something. Oh, that's right. So now you're doing two events on, on yeah, we do, Winter and Summer. We used yeah. to do four events. We do Winter Songs East, then we did Winter Songs West, then we did mm -hmm. Summer Songs West, then we did Summer Songs East in August. Mm -hmm. But my health is not what it was. Mm -hmm. No, and I found that I just could not, um, I couldn't travel twice a year across the country on planes because mm -hmm. there's so many germs and diseases and stuff on planes. That was hard for me. And also the temperature and the weather back east was too much for me. Mm -hmm. And so a few years ago, there was a winter when they had like 14 major blizzards in uh, New England, and we had to cancel camp because mm. the blizzard and nobody had signed up. We were two weeks before camp, I think we had 17 people signed up. And we just decided, let's not do a winter camp in, in New England, you know. Right. Let's just, uh, so now we have Winter Songs West, which happens in January in, in Cambria, California, at Camp Ocean Pines. Right. Then we have Summer Songs West in June, in Canada, okay. and then we have Summer Songs East, still in the Catskills of New York. We're, we're it's right along the Hudson River now. We're having it at this beautiful place called Stony Point Center. Mm -hmm. And you're obviously a, a, a major part, of the key component in all three of those experiences. Well, yes, but I'm hoping that I won't be a key component in the future. I'm hoping that um, what will happen is that I will um, be able to um, inspire people to carry on uh, even after I retire. So I might not be a teacher at every camp in the future, but I might be there, you know, mm -hmm. to support and for advice and help for the staff. Yeah. Um, and But the uh, level of teaching and the level of learning that go on is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to do a, a little side by here for a second and just acknowledge to everybody who's watching that our connection is through uh, the people who, <clears throat> the, the the overlap of your your universe and my universe are the people, some of the people that go to the Positive Music Festival, which happens in Florida now every February-ish. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but David was a guest on the show about a month ago. He was. Yeah, and he just uh, was very clear in his in his praise and gratitude to you for summer songs, and spoke about you know the the the, uh, 
friendships that he's enjoyed as a result of that whole experience. So I thought that you, you'd probably love to hear that. It was wonderful to hear David talk about it, of course. Yes. Well, David and Sloan are like my brother and sister in this. Mm. They they were there right from the very first camp. And, they, and also some other wonderful songwriters. Julie Snow was there at the first camp. Bill Tumum and some other people, you know, and uh, they've continued to be involved mm -hmm. with summer songs. And uh, David and Sloan, I just adore them. They're, yeah. They inspire me and I love them deeply. Yeah. So let's get into some more nuts and bolts, Penny. Let's talk about the dates. The, the Summer Songs West is happening June 3rd to the 7th. Funny you should ask. Yes. I have a poster. Excellent. I Hold up that poster. From. Hold up that poster. <laughs> Let's have a good look at it. Well, this one, this is just, <clears throat> it's just, um, this was for the West Coast, and uh, Summer Songs West is coming up June 3rd through June 7th. Yeah. And it's featuring, as our teachers, John Smith. I don't know if you know John Smith. I, I have yet to meet John. I, I look forward to meeting him. Ordinary songwriter. Yes, brilliant, brilliant songwriter and a great teacher and very inspiring people. Love working with John. I love him totally. Mm -hmm. Janice Stanfield, who oh, came yes, out Janice from Stanfield. the Posse uh, conference and the positive music experience and empower. And sh this is the first time we're having Jana and also you, Nathan, are going to be mm -hmm. there as a teacher. And um, Jana's going to be teaching songwriting, and you're going to be doing a Playing Well with Others class, which is our wonderful, you know, learning how to play as a group. Yeah. Very important for songwriters because they all, all end up standing up on stage by themselves, you know, yeah. singing songs. And it's much more interesting for the audience to hear a bunch of people playing songs <laughs> so uh, together. And yeah. uh, you can play off of each other. There's a lot more creative energy going on. Uh, and then you're doing a chart writing class as well. Yep. And Jan mm -hmm. is doing uh, two songwriting classes. John is going to do one songwriting and one performance class. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching singing and uh, this wonderful class I love called Vocal Recording Technique, which is um, all about um, if you're uh, planning to record or make a record, there's a way that you want to prepare yourself to sing for a record that's a little different than what you do live. And so that that class is all about how to do that, how to prepare yourself for making a record as a vocalist. And uh, I'm doing that with Mark Dam. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I do it with Ed Tree. He's also a recording engineer, but Mark is coming out um, he has a studio in Woodstock, New York, and also another one in New York City. And mm -hmm. he did, he was one of the engineers who did the fast folk recordings that are now in the Smithsonian. He's a famous, famous recording engineer and also a great musician, just mm -hmm. fantastic. You'll love mm -hmm. him. If you haven't mm -hmm. met him before, you're going to love Mark Dan. Um, and Dale LaDuc is going to be teaching piano, and he's he has this wonderful band in Los Angeles, and man, he's just incredible. And so he he's a great pianist, a great songwriter, and he, he's great with doing vocal arrangements. He and I have taught uh, the harmony class for years together out here. Uh, mm -hmm. This year, the honeysuckle possums, who I mentioned before, are going to teach the harmony class with Dale. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, now that I think of it, okay, they're going to do a Hapa Holly song for the harmony class. And I think that Dale's ukulele class is going to also learn the song, possibly. And Rebecca Troon's swing guitar class is going to learn the song. And they're all going to play it together. Oh, fabulous. And sing it together. It's, um, it's called a hokey lao. I, you know, are you going to a hokey lao? <laughs> we did it the, uh, last night at Rebecca's, but it's really going to be fun. And I've got, mm -hmm. and now I've started a little collection of costumes, a costume box for the West Coast. They don't get the costume thing on the West Coast because on the East Coast, everybody's used to it because they've been to the summer camp before and they remember, oh yeah, we used to wear 
Indian headbands and we ran around, you know. Uh, but on the West Coast, people look at the costume box and they're like, what is this for? Why do we <laughs> Not as many people went to summer camp as kids. Yeah, yeah. But I'm getting, you know, I'm kind of trying to educate them about, you know, mm -hmm. camp. So I have a lot of uh, really cool um, grass skirts. And I'm going to ask everyone to bring Hawaiian shirts, you know. And, and we'll have a little bit of a, of a, a luau type feel for that. Cool. That's really interesting because I grew up in Montreal, you know, enjoyed summer camp. was a big part of my experience. And, you know, it, it's been interesting to hear you talk about this because, yeah, that's been my experience in Vancouver, too. It's not yeah. it's not as much a part of the culture yeah. out here. And it's interesting that, that 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 is the case all the way up the coast. Like yeah. That. And it's, what's weird is is that on the East Coast, this is an established cultural tradition. Mm. On the West Coast, it's not so much. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes deep. It goes deep into the way... Our culture is set up, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of life that people led on the East Coast and the kind of life people have led f for a long time on the West Coast yeah. does not seem to bring camp into the picture as much out, out here. Yeah. But it's, you know, people love it. People are, we're all, the whole community is, you know, it's fantastic. It's bliss. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people have come and, you know, at the end of camp, they send me an email or something or write me a note and say, this this has been the most amazing experience I've ever had or this has changed my life or, you know, things like that. And, you know, what can I say? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, my good friend uh, Lisa is asking a question. I hope there are pictures. Are pictures posted on, on Summer Songs? Oh, yeah. In past years? After every camp. We all post, especially on the Facebook page. Um, the Facebook page is there's Summer Songs Chat. Okay. And that's the Summer Songs East Facebook page. And then there's Summer Songs West. And that's the West Coast Facebook page. Okay. I'll find those. Yeah. And, and that's where people post a lot of pictures after camp. Okay. Uh, Sharon just put it in the uh, in the chat here, private groups. But the public page is Facebook.com Summer Songs. Wow. So, excellent, thank you, Sharon. And uh, uh, let's take advantage of this moment, Penny, to talk about the sites that I we want people to know. The site uh, to learn more about Summer Songs is SummerSongs.com. Yeah, www.SummerSongs.com or www.SummerSongs.org. Oh, do the same. Webs. Okay. And uh, and for people who want to know more about your illustrious past and present, there's wow. pennynichols.com. Yeah, we can check, you know, what is it, the National Enquirer? And <laughs> Find out about that alien baby. <laughs> yeah, the and alien all baby. That, all that oh, stuff. Yeah. You know, the horns that grow in the back of my head. I don't know. <laughs> Old Montana, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, uh, pennynichols.com. And I teach, you know, singing online uh, mm -hmm. and harmony singing and songwriting and stuff. And that's all that information is at pennynichols.com. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Summer Songs East, the dates of Summer Songs East in August. Summer Songs East is going to be so fabulous. We've already got a lot of people signed up for it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be at this new place where uh, we're very excited about called Stony Point Center. Right. Uh, July 31st through August 6th. Sharon's on it. I All ask right. you the question. Sharon answers before oh. you. God bless you, Sharon. Hey, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And <laughs> Uh, we have two options on the East Coast. You can do the short session uh, for less money, or you can do the full week program mm. there, which is nice because some people can't afford or can't don't have the time to do. Uh, let's see, somebody said yeah. Penny.com. Uh, is it is it www? Yes, it, yeah. I just I just left it out uh, random else because I just thought everybody would know that the three W's are yeah. before any, any the name of any website. So yes, yes. and the W's in front. Yes, cool. So um, so that'll I be the focus. Our questions. Uh, I was just going to ask you that. 
Is there is there anything that we haven't said? Is there anything that's missing? Oh, teachers at Summer Songs East. Yes. You're going to have Excellent. some very cool teachers. Abby Newton. Mm-hmm. Abby Gardner. Abby. Sharon is your Sharon is your, Abby she's, Gardner. Reading your she's reading your mind. Yeah, well, what mind there is left. Yeah, <laughs> Abby Gardner is going to be there and she's a wonderful singer-songwriter. And um I think she was part of a group called Red Molly. Mm-hmm. That still is. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, Andy just, Andy just wrote Red Molly. Yeah. yeah, Red Molly. And also a wonderful songwriter from um, Maine, uh, Jed Caswell. Jed mm-hmm. Caswell, who's uh, just, he's like the quintessential uh, New England songwriter. He, he writes these beautiful, beautiful songs about the New England experience. And we've had him at camp before, and he's a he's a really nice guy and a good teacher. So those are our two new uh, songwriting teachers mm-hmm. this year. And of course, we also have David Roth and Sloan Wainwright and Mark Dan and Glenn mm-hmm. Rothell, who oh, yeah. is a total treasure. Indeed. If you don't know who Glenn Rothell is, check out uh, Glenn Rothell. Folks. I've had a I've had a bromance with Glenn for years. <laughs> yeah. Now. Yeah, I've had a bromance with him too, but yeah. you know, it's weird. Okay. <laughs> so all I'm saying is I love the guy totally. Yeah. And yeah. it's more like um aunt aunt and nephew or mom and son kind of relationship. But mm-hmm. I just adore him. And he's yeah. he's a fantastic musician and he helps yeah. everybody. He makes yeah. the whole camp kind of glow. Yeah, so we're yeah. going to have a great time, as always. Mm-hmm. And Sue, Sue Riley's going to be there teaching um, piano. Right, and it was Sue, uh, coming back to something I said earlier, Sue, of course, being the uh, the uh, spine of the Posse Awards, along with Richard D.C., and yeah. her talking about how Summer Songs was, was, was hugely responsible for her emergence and growth as a songwriter and, how, you know, how grateful she is about that. So it was just, I had no idea. You know, I, I've met everybody and then you, you kind of start learning the backstory about people and how they're connected. And it was just wonderful to see her light up when she talked about the impact that Summer Songs has had on her life. Well, the impact that she's had on my life is to become like my sister. I adore her. And mm. she, I met her through David Roth. Right. David brought her to camp. Right. And, you know, when you come to camp and you see all these light bulbs going off in people's faces, you know, and the, just the, them making the connection between their own ability to grow creatively mm-hmm. uh, and in every other way you can imagine, I guess, um, is it's just fantastic. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I'm, I'm honored that you asked uh, me to be a part of it. Yeah. And I, I'm looking forward to experiencing it firsthand, and yeah, I'm psyched. Yeah. And it's, it's been fun to think about it as the days get closer to think about what I'm going to bring to it. And and I'll, I'll miss Glenn being at Summer Songs West, of course, because, you know, just the idea of doing anything without Glenn makes me sad, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, Glenn and Don happen to be uh, vacationing in the West. Uh-huh. We're going to come to our 30th wedding anniversary dinner the night before camp. They Which I will, oh, gonna I'm delighted to hear that because I'll be there. I'll be there that night as well. So, oh, so good. we'll get to hang with them. Oh, good. I hope you're preparing a song, a limerick, or a speech, or something. I am. I am now. Good. <laughs> so we're going to roast each other. We're going to roast marriage in general okay. at the uh, dinner. So, so talk a little bit about that because that's that's a big moment that I'm sure a lot of people don't know. You you're celebrating 30 years with yes. your partner, Mark. Yes, my dear darling husband Mark and I uh, met at the Buddhist monastery that I went to in Woodstock, New York, on my way back to school in hmm. 1984, and we got married there in 1986, and we've been together ever since. Wow. He actually, when you think about it. If it weren't for Mark Rothy, I wouldn't have had the stability Mm. and the support to create summer songs. Mm. 
and he used to come to camp back east and put on these wild musicals at camp. And this was part of what he, you know, wanted to contribute. To. But he's just getting around to the idea that maybe he could come to the West Coast camps and do the same thing. He'd take a song, any an old song, like an old rock and roll song like Stagger Lee or mm -hmm. at the Station, and turn it into a 15-minute extravaganza using 20 people on stage with costumes and sets. And then he'd stop in the middle of the song and give a talk. And then they go on and sing a little more and the background singers would be doing their thing and people would be acting out parts and then he'd stop everybody and he'd talk some more. It's just <laughs> it's like, hello. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's probably what the um, 30th anniversary dinner will be like. We're going to have mm -hmm. another one after Summer Songs East. So mm -hmm. all of our East Coast friends can come and come on too. So. Well, I have a very strong sense of how, well, based on my camp experiences, I have a, you know, my kind of standard phrase for people uh, on the West Coast to whom, whom I'm describing my camp experiences. Yeah, I was one of those you had to be there. And there are a few friends I have now in Vancouver who were part of that in Montreal. And we get together and we're able to just kind of look at each other and nod. There's this whole universe of experience we shared that you just can't begin to articulate to anyone else. So, so yeah, I'm glad that I'll be, uh, I'll be adding to uh, that. Summer songs West will be adding to my, my experience of that yes. kind of thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely love it. So the dates again, let's just say this once more, uh, summer songs uh, West is happening June 3rd to the 7th summer songs East, uh, July 30th to August 6th. Yes. And if I have it wrong, by golly, I know Sharon's going to be on me any second now. Yeah. <laughs> She's got it. In fact, if we go and back, I think we can see where it is. I don't know if we can scroll back. That's yeah, I got it. July 31st okay. through August 6th. Yep. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Sharon. There she is, right as I thought she would be. <laughs> and uh, for those who want more information about Summer Songs, uh, www.summersongs.com or .org, and more about Penny at www.pennynichols.com. Did we get it all? Did we say it all? I think I think we have covered a lot of territory. We well, we have definitely covered a lot of territory. Please, Penny, tell people when they can expect your book. Oh, that's my exciting. autobiography. Yeah, wow. It's an ongoing. <laughs> I'm working on it. I am working on it, and I don't know how long it will take. Uh, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I remember some wild scene from, you know, uh, the Buffett days or you know, back in San Francisco in the hippie days or something. And I'll get up and I'll work for a couple hours writing it all in. I've, I've got it set up like an outline, you know, uh -huh. yep. I covered all the highlights in the outline. And then as these memories come back into my brain, I go and fill in the outline, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm about a fifth of the way or maybe an eighth of the way through the outline. Okay. I got a ways to go. Yeah. That's time. And do you have people that will help you with it, with the book? Well, as time goes on, I may need more help. We'll see. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to just, uh, um, I'm going to be indulgent here and speak on behalf of, I, I have a friend who is probably the world's biggest Beatle fan. Uh, I kid you not, he sends me uh, something that he's found online about the Beatles every week. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Like he's just so. I just have to ask you on his behalf. You went over to uh, it's. I don't know the Beatles story, and I don't know how long it would be to tell it. But your connection was to George, or it's George that you met, right? Yes. Uh, well, I met George and Paul and John. Wow. I didn't meet Ringo, but what happened in a in a nutshell is that when I was living uh, in San Francisco and playing there. I met Jenny Boyd, mm -hmm. a friend of an, a friend of mine, Judy Wong, mm -hmm. and um, Jenny uh, invited me to come and see her in London if I ever got over there. And you know, I really, really liked her. We were good friends, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I didn't know at the time that I would ever have an opportunity to do that. But then, when I recorded, that was in the spring of '67. 
And by January of 68, I had recorded this record for Buddha Records in New York. Mm -hmm. And this we did this tour of Europe with Captain Beefheart and his magic band. And we got to London. And the first thing I did when we got there was go over to, I had contacted Jenny and went over to the Apple clothing store that was happening. And we sat on the floor of a dressing room and played, and I played music and we talked and stuff. And I bought some, the whole cap, uh, Sergeant Pepper outfit with, you know, green velvet pants and an aqua velvet cape and a satin yellow mm -hmm. gold satin blouse mm -hmm. there, but it was very sergeant pepper and at the end of the afternoon jenny said hey why don't you come and stay with me uh, at our house we she and alex martis who was known as magic alex were living in a townhouse that i believe mm -hmm. was owned by george and patty mm -hmm. jenny's mm -hmm. older sister and uh, so we went over so i you know left my manager and the rest of the tour in the hotel they were staying at. And I just went there, picked up my stuff and went over to this uh, place where Jenny was living. And so I stayed with them uh, while I was in London. And I think the first or second night, you know, George and Patty came over for dinner. I remember the first night. And then the second night, Patty was doing a, a runway modeling mm -hmm show you know uh in london and uh john lennon came over and i don't remember if he was who he was with i don't remember i don't know if this was before yoko or uh after yoko i don't remember but in any case he was there and we all went over to this show that patty was doing and uh then uh the next day George and Alex took me to their new Apple Studios and we spent the day um, at the studio and I wow. recorded a couple of songs with them and I got to play with the oscilloscope and the oscillator, which was my favorite part of the thing because I was trying to make an oscillator is a tone generating machine that you use to calibrate mm -hmm. uh, recording equipment. An oscilloscope is a screen that shows you the shape yep. and form of the sound. And I was experimenting with making my voice match the oscillator. The oscillator has no overtones or undertones. The human voice has many overtones and undertones. And I wanted to get a pure sound like, you know, and try to exactly mimic the oscillator. So I spent a bunch of time doing that. And they recorded these songs. And then that night, George asked me if I wanted to um, wow. make a record with him. And I said, you know, I was extremely excited. And I called my manager, Billy, Billy, George Harrison wants to make a record with me. What should I tell him? And my manager said, tell him yes, tell him yes. So the next, I said, yes. And the next day, there was a big black limousine parked in front of the um, condo mm -hmm. where we were. And, um, uh, you know, chauffeur came up, knocked on the door. Is Penny Nichols here? Well, Artie Rip wants to talk to her. And he's out here in this limousine. And I went out to the limousine. There was my producer, Artie Rip. And he just looked at me and said, um, if you try to get out of your contract, and record with George Harris and you'll mm. never see your manager again. And I was 18 years old, you know, I believed him because I knew that mm. he had been a driver for the mob when he was younger. And I, I just, I, for everything I'd been through with Buddha records at that point said, mm. these are not people to mess around with. So um, I called Billy back and said, Billy, this is what Artie Rip said to me just now. And Billy said, ignore him. Don't worry about that. Just go ahead and make the record with George. But I, I couldn't do it. I was terrified. I was terrified for Billy because Billy and Judy, my managers, I lived with them. They saved my life. 
practical. And I just, you know, hmm. I, I couldn't do it. I and that broke my heart. And then Jenny asked me to go to hmm. India with them, and I couldn't do that either. <laughs> so I was, and as it turned out, I know I don't know if you've ever read Patty, Patty Harrison's hmm. biography, her hmm. autobiography. It's fascinating. Because when I finally, when I read her autobiography, I thought, man, I'm so glad hmm. that I didn't get involved in all that. It's turned out to be something that I would have, it would never have been good for me. I just wasn't a strong enough person. I was too naive. You know, I was only there because I liked Jenny and she was my friend. And I was thrilled, of course, to be in that situation. But, you know, I wasn't tough enough or strong enough for all that stuff. So that's what that well, was Well, what a about. wonderful story. And what a, I just love the, the clarity that, that your hindsight has given you about how it worked out perfectly. It worked out exactly as it should have. Yeah. Uh, well, for mm -hmm. a long time, I felt like a failure, you know, like, well, I had these incredible mm -hmm. opportunities and I blew them all. But then over time, you know, I began to see the wisdom of how things mm -hmm. worked out. Yeah. I came back home and my brother, who was very close to me, he died of leukemia mm -hmm. in, the, in 1970. So it was good that I was home. It was good that I got to spend time with him before he yeah. died. And that was much more important. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things, yeah. you know, that shape a life. And yeah. it's some of mine. Yeah. I, I, uh, when I do this show and when I give my talk, you know, I, there are four points in the talk. And one of them is, you know, what I call the being grateful for the whole process. Things that on the outset look like huge can be seen as steps sideways or backward and in the end turn out to be real gifts. You know? That's exactly so. right. It was a gift. I'm, I'm very grateful for the way my life has turned out. Very, just really deeply grateful. Well, I am yeah. too. And I'm so grateful that you, you made the time. Penny, I just want to acknowledge everyone. Penny and I went through so much to make this happen. We had some real issues with Blab and Penny was a trooper and smiling all the way through. I was not smiling so much at my end, but but we got through it. And my God, we've had a wonderful conversation, and you were worth you were worth all of that effort. So thank you, Penny. I really appreciate you making the time. And, and uh, yeah, I look forward to look forward to spending uh, a new experience with you. Yes, and yeah. we are. So okay, don't you go away. Time. I'm just I'm going to wrap this up, and then I'll put the recording on pause, and you and I can speak a little bit more. Uh, for those of you watching in real time, thank All you right. so much for spending the last hour and change with Penny and I. I've been speaking to Penny Nichols, songwriter uh, extraordinaire, who is the, uh, the, the brains, the creator of Summer Songs, a fantastic experience which is changing lives uh, for songwriters on both the East and the West Coast. And you can find out more about it at the websites, Summer Songs, uh, at, sorry, at summersongs.com or .org. And Penny's site is pennynichols.com. And there will be a replay available of this show um, soon, if not within the next hour, then certainly this evening. And uh, feel free to share it with your friends because we really want to get um, Penny's work in Summer Songs out to a wider audience. So please do that. There we go. Thank you so much, everyone. Love and blessings. You stay right there, Penny. I hope you enjoyed the show, everyone. Please let everyone know about it. Okay. Bye for now.